Good morning, Best Grove, and I want to thank you all for worshiping with us this morning and those who are out there visiting with us for the first time. Thank you for being a part of us. You could have visited any place, a worship with anyone within the city or in a virtual space, but thank you for being a part of us today. I thank God for you and ask God's continued blessings upon you and all that you do in his holy name. I ask you to go in prayer with me as we prepare to share a word with you this morning. So pray with me right now. Eternal God, we thank you. Thank you for all that you've done as we prepare to celebrate your life as we live every day for you. Prepare us our hearts and minds as we get ready to go into the word to understand how we can live better. To live in a world that seems so hostile to you. That wants to live its own way and doesn't know that Living according to your will and being ordered by your word provides a better life for each and every person in the world around us. That it brings us together and it brings unity. That when we live for you and love for you, it does make a difference. Therefore, God, help us to be still and put aside everything that keeps you from being first in our lives. Touch us right now. Help us to be still from all the things that have kept us busy. Let us focus on you right now, God. Forgive us for all our transgressions, because we come with a lot of stuff, a lot of baggage, a lot of pain, a lot of misery, but help us to be still and know that you're God right now. Through a song that's been sung, or through some words that's through the scripture, or through the prayer, help us to come to know you better. But not only do we ask for forgiveness, we forgive others, God, that we may enter worship with a pure heart and a right spirit. And we pray that someone may come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. We thank you for it all now, God. So we invite you into our heart and our presence and have your way. And let something be said that we will meditate on through the rest of the week until we are challenged again by your word to live a better life to be convicted, convinced, and converted to be the people that you are calling for in times like these. Now hide me in the shadow of Calvary that I be not seen, that I may convey your message of hope, truth, and salvation to these my brothers and sisters in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all again. I appreciate you and I thank God for you. And I want to uh, let you know our word this morning is coming from the uh, gospel according to uh, Matthew's gospel, chapter 27, verses 3 and 4 from um, the NRSV and the message paraphrase. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 3 and 4, from the NRSV and the Message Paraphrase, and it reads as thus. Judas, the one who betrayed him, realized that Jesus was doomed, was overcome with remorse. He gave back the 30 silver coins to the high priest saying, I've sinned, I've betrayed an innocent man. 
They said, what do we care? That's your problem. Peterson's paraphrase says this. Judas, the man who betrayed him, realized that Jesus was doomed. Overcome with remorse, he gave back the 30 silver coins to the high priest, saying, I've sinned. I betrayed an innocent man. They said, what do we care? That's your problem. What do we care? That's your problem. And for a few moments today, I'd like to talk to you about the confessions of a traitor and his cold-blooded conspirators. The confession of a traitor and his cold-blooded conspirators. There are times in our lives when people will do things or Christians will do things that are totally diametrically opposed to the life that Christ has called us to. For whatever reason, we sin. And we conspire with others to do things to get them to do what we think is best or what our plans are. And sometimes those plans do more harm than they do any good. And when we realize what we've done, we try to, we have remorse, but really no real repentance, but we have remorse. And we try to get it together, but we realize what we've done. We try to fix it, but we end up making more mess than we've ever done before. And instead of going to God, we end up going in the wrong places. If anything this lesson teaches us about Judas is that we ought to always go to God. Scripture had to be fulfilled according to Matthew. Where it's the only place it's recorded there and other than Acts. And other than in the prophecy of Zechariah and Jeremiah. But it's only recorded here as a fulfillment in this. But after Peter had went crying after he denied Jesus. And after the uh, trial of Jesus. Here he goes weeping into the night. And Judas goes back and tells him I've. Made this, I've done wrong. I've, I've saw what you all have done. And now Jesus is innocent of this. He, I've done wrong. Let's change this. And he throws and he says, no, that's your problem. And he throws the money back there. And he runs out and he hangs himself. Hmm. What happens when we conspire to do wrong? And I want to look at that. Judas, let's hurry today. Judas, imagine him. He didn't start off that way. Many of us don't start that way either. You know in your journey with God how it started, how delighted you were, how excited you were, how you put all you had into it. How you made every bit of Christian education you could. How you tried to absorb every bit of truth. But you hadn't fully committed. That's the difference. You were there. You were by the fire. But you hadn't caught on fire. You were right there in the midst of everybody. You were enjoying the miracles. You were enjoying the fish. You were enjoying the feeding. And even had a position in the group. And in the ministry, in the church, you may even have a place nowadays as a deacon or a mother or a trustee, as a pastor, as a choir member, as an usher, as any leader in the church, youth leader, director, praise and worship. You can have all these positions and still not be with a right relationship with Jesus. Being close is not good enough. 99 and a half just won't do. And that's the problem with Judas. Judas remembers the love that Jesus, Jesus did his part. And if we remember in our own lives, Jesus has always been there for us. Jesus has always kept his word. He never denied us. He never went back on his word. He's always been true to it. Always faithful. Always true to us. Always loving. Always merciful. Always kind. Always considerate. Always there in the midnight hour. When we call him, he answers. 
When we seek him, we find him. When we knock, he answers. He's present for us. Can you imagine Judas knowing when he was there with the feeding of the 5,000, doing the healings of the people that were sick, when he cast out demons and when he saw dead people rise and walk? Can you imagine that experience? Can you imagine some experiences in your own lives where you've seen the power of God at work in people's lives as well as your own? Can you, can you feel that where God has entrusted you with gifts and abilities and responsibilities of his that he's given you. And what have you done with it? What are your motives behind it? Why are you where you are? Are you there because you love God? Are you there because you're trying to fill a square? Are you trying to please people? Or because you grew up thinking that's where I ought to be? Because my mama was like that. My daddy was like that. My uncle was like that. This is a family tradition. No. Cut it out. That's not what it's all about. Your mom and your daddy can't get you to heaven. They can point you in the right direction, but they don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. Much as I love my mom and daddy, they don't have that kind of power. They don't have that kind of juice. They had a lot of love. They had a lot of mercy and goodness and kindness, but they don't have what Jesus has. They don't have what Jesus have to do. He, they didn't get up from the grave like he did. They don't, they, don't, they don't have the ability to live with me like he lives with me and saves me. His, their blood does not wash away sin. It gave me great memories and still live because of who he is. They believed in him and their memories are fresh to me every day. But it's his mercies that are new for me. It's his grace that wakes me up every day. Though I failed yesterday. And though I didn't do right yesterday. Though I thought wrong yesterday. He's still good to me today. And when I woke up this morning. I woke up with him thanking him. Because how good he's been to me. Despite my own failures. Judas forgot. Judas didn't have the right relationship. Judas only came so far. And how many of you all have just come so far, but not all the way? When Judas realized what was going on and he saw the trial proceeding on and he saw where they captured Jesus and betrayed him and all these events are going on and he's got access and looking at what's going on and he realized that his plan had gone awry. And that an innocent man now, a man that had done good, a man that had blessed people, a man that made a difference in his community, a man that had that changed the landscape, a man that had began to make lives and communities realize that people who were on the periphery of society were somebodies. People that thought they were nobodies were now considered people that were in the places, that were on the outside of places. Nobodies were somebodies. People that were down below now had access. Women who were considered outsiders and nobodies were now considered people of importance. He made people feel as though they were somebody. He gave them the recognition because Jesus came in and stepped in like he wanted people to know who he was. This, what Jesus was saying, is what your heavenly father is like. He was not like what the temple did. He was not like what the people had turned things around and how the temple process had made it. God was sick and tired of being sick and tired of all that stuff they were trying to do. All that wasted blood and all those routines and how they'd gotten over on the poor and underprivileged and how they'd turned schemes and banquets and everything into everything money raises for the temple and how they had set up these rules and regulations that kept people out more than getting people in. They even made it so difficult that God didn't even want to show up. How hard and tragic it was. Isaiah says, I'm sick of your feast. I'm sick of that noise. I'm sick of your incense. They stink. How can we get like that? How can people get like that? It's because when their motives are wrong. 
when they're doing it for the wrong reasons. We can come to worship and have the wrong reasons. Our aim, our main motive for coming to worship is to worship God. To seek his face. To render unto him what's due to him, his praise. To seek his will. First seek the kingdom of heaven. You got to praise God. Seek his will. Seek his understanding. Commit yourself to him and his ways and then he will direct your path. We fail so often at that. We come wanting to be entertained. We come wanting the church and the choir to get us going. We come wanting the fire stoked. You ought to look in the mirror every morning and just say thank you. You ought to be stoked every time you get up. I know you got pain in your life. I know you're going through some stuff. You ain't the only one been broke. You ain't the only one been through hard times. You ain't the only one been crying. Look at the testimonies of those who done made it. You think you had hard times? Try to have been a slave. You think you've had hard times? Been poor with a P-O, not P-O-R. You think you had hard times because you can't get a Game Boy or, 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 or electronic game now? Try not having a car to drive and walking in the rain. Drag with no shoes. We look at things from what the context in which we live, but we're no one's live where other people have lived. And we try to base it on what we have now, but you ain't been where other people have been. But there's something unique about this. When you struggle and when you know God for yourself, you know your own story. You don't need someone else's. And when we fail at living for God and bringing our best to God, that's when things become routine and mundane. That's when they become mediocre. Because we can't give our best to God because we're too busy looking at I and we and us. Instead of looking at thou. Instead of looking at how holy he is and how loving and compassionate and righteous he is. We're busy looking at ourselves. Judas only came halfway. Judas only came part of the way. Judas didn't give himself fully to God. Don't make the same mistake. Because you too will do what Judas fell into the trap of. When Judas wanted Jesus to do for whatever reason he wanted Jesus to do, he went to the priest and conspired with them. What would you do if I betrayed him? What would you give me? And they gave him the price that they would give for a slave. 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. Make it rain. For whatever reason Judas thought, whatever motive that was behind all that, they thought that was going, whatever he thought that plan was going to do for Jesus, it didn't work. And when he looked and saw what they were doing to Jesus, Sometimes we have to see what our plans have done to other people for us to realize the mess we have made with other people. The mess we've made not only against other people and sinned against other people, but the mess we made against God. See, hanging around the church and hanging around Sunday school and Bible study and being, hearing the sermons does have an impact because you do learn something. You do learn some of the word. And I can imagine his, his upbringing brought back some stuff. You got to be careful how you treat God's people. You got to be careful. I remember probably the Deuteronomy code was ringing in his head what you're doing, how you treat innocent people. And that had to ring in Judas's mind and his heart, how it brought back to him what he learned at Sunday school and probably at his folks' feet and what he learned at, 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 the, at, 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 at the synagogue, what he learned there and was taught and realized that something was wrong. And he rem had remorse. Not repentance, remorse about what he had done. And he came back and said, here is this money. There's an innocent man. He made confession. He came back to the very people he had conspired with. And said, here's an innocent man. What are we going to do? 
he's innocent of this. We know he's innocent. And they look at him and said, uh, he says, I've sinned. I betrayed this innocent man. Oh, and they like, well, okay. That's your problem. Hmm. Cold-bloodedness. The conspirators were cold-blooded. What, what did Jesus, what did Judas do when he went to them? This is what happens when we go to the wrong people. They were callous, emotionless. They were calculating. They already knew what they were going to do anyway, and they got him to do. He was just a pawn in their plan, and it fit perfectly what they wanted to do because they had already worked it out. They would already schemed it out. They had every I dotted and every T crossed how they were going to manipulate and get Jesus in there to do what they wanted done because they knew they couldn't kill him. They knew they didn't want to cause a riot, but they wanted him dead. They wanted his ministry dead. They wanted his, the, the, the miracles stopped. They wanted things to go back to normal. They wanted to be the big eyes. They wanted people to stop and talk about them. They wanted the community to be the buzzword. They wanted their names to be talked about. They didn't want this Galilean carpenter who didn't go to their schools, who wasn't a part of their groups to be talked about. They wanted him silenced, but he wouldn't be silenced. They were cold-blooded. They were, they had, they were merciless. They had no remorse. They didn't care about justice. They had no compassion. They had no compunction about what they did. They were just mean, cold-blooded people. And in their day, I guess they thought they were doing the right thing, trying to protect what they had. Religion they had. Jesus was the threat to what was going on in their day. But Jesus was a new power and that God was trying to win the people back. But they couldn't see it even though they had access to the word. Even though they were the educated people of the day. Even though they were taught the scriptures. They still couldn't get the clue. They lost out on that. They missed out on that. Because they couldn't see it. Because all they wanted to do was get back to where they were. They were calculated, cold-blooded, callous. And they're like that today. You've met it. You've done it. You've seen it. You participated in it. You plotted and schemed with other folk. And it turned out just the same way. And you went to those folks saying, you know, we've done wrong. And they looked at you like you was crazy. So, and then they turn on you. That's the, that's the, ain't that the ironic thing? You go and try to get it right. And then they turn on you. Then you realize how important you were in the plan. You wasn't nothing to begin with to start with. You were just that. Nothing. They didn't care about you to begin with. All they needed you was for was to be a tool to get their work done. That was it. That's all you were, an object or a part of a plan or a piece of a puzzle to get something done that they needed done. And you were it. And then when you come back to do it with them, to get it right with them, to explain yourself, they don't want to hear nothing you have to say. And then they act like you're the one that's all guilty about it. They act like they had nothing to do with it. They want to wash their hands like Pilate. I got nothing to do with this. But everybody got a part in that. Everybody that conspires. Well, you get on the phone. It's funny how people can pass out wrong more than they can pass out right. Funny how we can text more wrong than we can text more right. Funny how the news media perpetrates more wrong and misinformation. and They do all the good that's out there. All this grandizement, all this speculation, all this fluff and stuff about nothingness, all this stuff about hate and crime and all. But there's so much good being done that it's not being shown. There are good people out there. 
Not all races are bad. Not all police officers are bad. Not all firemen are bad. Not all preachers are corrupt and, and whoremongers. Not all women are bad. But the way the media would portray some of it and the way some of us continue to scandalize one another, everybody's just going to hell in a handbasket. But that ain't what the Lord teaches us. We are saved by grace and grace alone. You can call us whatever you want, but we know we got an appointment with God. We know we've been saved by grace and by by our belief in him, by accepting him as our personal Lord and Savior, and by living for him and dedicating our life to him by daily devotion, by picking up our cross daily and walking with him. By giving ourselves to him daily. Every day, torn as ragged as we are, by giving ourselves to him to the best of our ability. And that's all he asks. That's why grace is in place. You ain't perfect. But his perfection comes in working with you every day. You ain't got it all together yet. You won't get that till you get over there. You broken now. You're, you're a walking masterpiece. You're just all messed up and broken. But the pieces are coming together. The more you live for him, the more things come together. You're going to make mistakes like these. You're going to sin like this. Because folk going to make you mad. You ain't going to like some folk. People are going to conspire. You're going to do it. Look at the system. Look how the church has messed up over the years and how they conspire to continue to do evil upon evil and try to perpetrate a wrong upon a people. For what reason? To keep the status quo. That was wrong and evil. So we saw Judas' part. We saw the cold-blooded conspirators. Now what do you and I need to do? Well, this is what you don't do. You don't do what Judas did. You, Judas went to the wrong people. Judas went to the conspirators. You need to go to Jesus. If you really want a change in your life, and what the Bible teaches us in John's letter, he said, if you confess your sin, Jesus is righteous. Jesus will forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you of all your sins and will restore you. Yes, he will. That's what it's called. If, if, if you just go to him and say, look, Father, I, I'm like the sinner. I, it ain't got to be no long prayer. I, I'm like Jesus talked about the publican and the, and, 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 and the sinner who went up to pray, you know, the Pharisee and the publican who went up to pray. And he says, Pharisee looked over at that guy and says, man, I'm glad I'm not like him. I give my tithes. I do all the right things. I, I keep this. He said, he got the audacity to look up to heaven. I'm just, thank you, I'm not like him. You know, I got the audacity to cut his eye and look at him. Here this poor tax collector, knowing he's cheating people, manipulating the system, knowing he's taking advantage of folk. Knowing he's trying to make ends meet and knowing he don't like folk. We don't like folk. He we stick it to him. Oh, yeah. But then he bows his head and he beats on his chest. The Greek word, he's just, he just hating himself for what he's doing. And he's saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, which one do you think left went back? Which one did God forgive? Which one did God wipe the slate clean from? Everybody went Sunday school then, in modern vernacular. And they had to say, well, he did. Yeah. That's what God is looking for. The contrite heart. The person who's sincere inside here, who repents. Repent is turning from that. Not just remorse, but repentance. You need to repent from your sin. Turn from it and turn to God. You got to realize that the crime that you commit, that God can wipe that sin away. Romans says that God, just, just, we are justified by faith. That God drops the charges against us because of our faith. Our belief in Jesus Christ 
List all your sins on a piece of paper. And because you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, God erases them. Now, that doesn't mean that the consequences are gone for your sin. No, you don't become a little unpregnant. The consequences are still there. But what God does do is grace, mercy, long-suffering, strength, love. Kindness. He begins to build all those things into your character and intertwine it and knit things together so that your personality and your character begin to fit so that all that you did somehow, some way begins to change and be transformed so that it makes a difference. And where you messed up, you begin to make up and make a difference, a positive difference. Instead of being destructive, you become constructive. That's what the difference is. Once you believe in this risen Savior who hung, bled, suffered, and died on Calvary's cross, but early on Sunday morning got up with all power in his hands, that makes the difference. And who's got up and who's coming back again for you, it makes the difference. Don't be a Judas. Be a Peter. Peter and Judas, two different people. Peter went weeping into the night after denying Jesus three times. Both of them betrayed him. But Peter went to heaven. Judas hung himself. Your choice is yours. It's always your choice. It's not the group. You can't blame the group. It's your choice. It was Judas's choice. It's your choice today too. I ask you, invite you to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior today too. Ask him to come into your life. There's some cold-blooded people out there. Some cold-blooded people in the church. It's going to be that way till Jesus come back. When we come to our congregations, everybody ain't saved. They're not supposed to be. That's where people come to get saved. Everybody there is not that way. Some people have been taught there because that's what their mom and dad have been taught them to do. They've been coming to church to come into worship their whole lives, but don't realize that they are the church. And when you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you become the church. That's the building we come to. But we are the church. We get lost sometimes. People sometimes get confused and they think it's in cliques and groups and titles, positions. The position you need to be in is at the feet of Jesus. If you're kneeling, it's kneeling because you're praying to God, not because of another person. And if you're carrying a load, it's helping your brother or sister bear their burdens. Are you carrying the cross? You don't need to be carrying a bunch of junk. You don't need to be carrying a bunch of burdens. Cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. You don't need to be carrying around a lot of internal pain and suffering. Turn it over to the Lord. Lord, I release my agony and pain to you. Help me every day. Show me in your word. Put people in my way that's going to help make a difference in my life. And I will turn my life over to you each and every day. Show me and take me to a place where I can grow. Now pray this prayer with me. Lord, help me. I don't know you as my personal Lord and Savior, but I want to know you right now. So Jesus, I confess my sins. Forgive me of all my transgressions. I don't know all that they are. I've done some that I know I've done. And there's some I have no idea that I committed against you. Forgive me. Forgive me, and as you taught me, I confess all those things, and now I want to become a child of yours. I want a right relationship with you. So wash me and make me whole. I confess it to you now. Now help my belief. Help me, because I haven't seen you. I don't know you yet, but help me in my unbelief. Strengthen me so that I may come to know you. Show me in ways that I will know that you exist so that I can live for you and love for you and make a difference in the world so that the people will know that you exist because they can see the change in my life 
in my words, in my thoughts, as a result in the way I live. And I promise you, God, the more you show up in me, the more I'll show up for others, that you can show up in others in my life. I thank you now, God. Thank you for loving me and for coming into my life. Now lead me and guide me to the place where I need to be. In Christ's name, amen. If you said that, may God lead you to a place or find some place. If not there, you can find it. That's here at the Best Grove at 1065 Thomas Road or some place in your community or some, some congregation where you can learn. There are plenty of places in Goldsboro, wherever you are. Or if you're in the military, there's some military installations on base. Or wherever you are, find some place. Just ask God to lead you to a place. And God will definitely do that for you. So ask God to just lead you to that place where you need to go. And God will certainly do that for you. I want to thank you all for being with us today. And I want to ask God that you continue to uh, pray with us. And continue to send your tithes and offerings and your contributions to Best Grove. Uh, you can send them to... Uh, 1065 Thomas Road. I mean, come by the office at 1065 Thomas Road, Monday through Fridays from 10 to 2, and drop your donations and contributions and tithes there. Or you can mail them at Post Office Box 10726, Goldsboro, North Carolina, 27532. Or you can go to our website, bestgrovechurch.org, and do online giving there. And if you're a first-time giver, please continue to give to us. And if you've never, uh, if you want to continue giving, we would appreciate that. We do make a difference in our community. We are a church that loves to live the life that Christ has called us to. We thank God for you. We want you to know, too, also that uh, they are giving booster shots in our community now. Um, for those of you that have access to the base, uh, they are giving shots. I think you have to meet the requirements, though. But check with the base first call. I know they're doing walk-ins. I did call last week. And I know that Walgreens, you have to call. But I think you have to have, um, uh, you have to meet their criteria for um, having um, conditions uh, for that. Um, I forgot the conditions. Oh, uh, you got to have, uh, you can't be healthy, in other words. You got to have some sort of uh high blood pressure, uh, heart disease, so forth and so on. You have to have some conditions in order to get that shot. If you're healthy, you're not going to get the shot right off, basically, from what I understand. But you can call Walgreens and make an appointment online. Uh, they'll make an appointment with you, and they will let you know all the things you need to know. So get out there and get that done if you're interested in getting the shot or the booster shots. All right, thank you so much, and we ask God to continue to bless you. We hope to see you at Best Grove next Sunday at... Uh, 11 a.m. All right, God bless you, and I thank God for you. So we're looking for you to continue to pray with us as we continue to lift you up in the name of the Lord. Amen. The great God and all the people answered, Amen. Amen. Lifting up their the hands. The confessions of a traitor and his cold-blooded conspirators. And worship the Lord. God bless you. With their faces to the ground. When we receive a word from the Lord, our answer should be, Amen. Amen. Let the church say, Amen. Let the church say, Amen. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus say, Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. God has spoken. So let the church say, so let the church Say, Say amen. amen. Yeah, yeah. Let the church let them say amen. If you believe the word, let the whole church say amen. God has spoken. So let the church say Amen. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. God has spoken. So let the church say Amen. No. Thank you, Lord. God has spoken. So let the church say Amen.